The escalation of terrorism, global instability, crime, violence, and natural disasters indicate our world is falling toward its final hour with destiny. Who will survive the final events of Earth's history? Does the Bible give any answers? Hold back the veil of uncertainty. Know the future today. Join us as Amazing Facts presents Bible Prophecy Made Easy with speaker Eric Flickinger. Good evening and welcome back to the Bible Prophecy Seminar. Did you enjoy the concert? Yes. Yeah. Be glad to know we have another special music coming up. But first, the pressure's on you. You have a quiz. So if you would be so kind as to take out your quiz envelope, we'll get started. And let's have a word of prayer. That'll ease the tension. How's that? Father, heaven, thank you for the things that we've learned at this seminar so far. Thank you for the worship and music that we've just experienced. Please guide and direct us. Help us to remember the important things of the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. Question number one. And again, these are... Well, not all of them are true or false time. Some of them are. Number one, Jesus has given us the exact date of his second coming and end of the world. True or false? Question number two. Jesus tells us that in the last days, there will be an overwhelming interest in religion with many false Christs and false prophets appearing. True or false? And question number three. What conditions existed in Noah's day, which also exist today as a sign that the end is near? And you could have up to three answers at least that were commented on. Question four, yes or no? According to Bible prophecy, are we living in the last days of Earth's history? And can we expect Jesus to come soon? And the last question, number five. What is the greatest sign that the coming of Jesus is near? The greatest sign. Again, the honor system, you may grade your own paper. Jesus has given us the exact date of his second coming and end of the world, and the answer is false. What did Jesus say? No man knoweth the day or the hour right but my Father only. Amen? Number two, true or false, Jesus tells us that in the last days there will be an overwhelming interest in religion with many false Christs and false prophets appearing, and the answer is true. That's right. You know, some, I've, I've heard it implied that there would be a reduction in interest in religious things, but according to Jesus, there's to be intense interest. Isn't that right? Matthew 24. Number three, what conditions existed in Noah's day, which also exist today as a sign that the end is near, and the answer, there could be several, Okay, increased sin, any specific kinds of sin that we noticed in the seminar? Immorality. Immorality? Violence? Lawlessness? Lawlessness? Mm -hmm. You get the idea. Alcoholism, drunkenness is one of the things that he mentioned specifically. And number four, yes or no, according to Bible prophecy, are we living in the last days of earth's history and can we expect Jesus to come soon? Yes. You know, Eric and I chatted last night, and something we both uh, agreed upon that's quite interesting in the teachings of Jesus is, remember the analogy Jesus gave that uh, all these things, some people would say, you know, how do these things happen all of the time? Every generation is experienced to these to some degree or another. But remember Jesus said his coming, the warnings of his coming are like birth pains, right? And just like I remember when my children were born, the closer we got to the birth date, the more intense the contractions became, and the more frequent those contractions became. Isn't it amazing that even in the weather patterns, the tornadoes, hurricanes, many of the newscasts this year said, this is the worst ever, right? 
Are the contractions getting stronger? Absolutely. The Lord's trying to tell us something. Number five, what is the greatest sign that the coming of Jesus is near? The greatest sign. Matthew 24, 14, if you need it then. Answer? The word getting out. Yes, that's it. The gospel going to all the world. And that, that uh, window of, of people that need to hear the gospel, it, it's narrowing. And God has blessed us with tremendous uh, technology in our generation to spread the word more rapidly than ever. Surely with all those bad advantages, the gospel will be preached to all the world for witness to all nations. And the end will come soon. And that's exciting, isn't it? Perhaps it'll be our generation. I'm not trying to predict that, but I think the signs are telling us. We need to be aware, like Jesus said, it's near, even at the doors. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. I would invite you once again, if you would like to uh, return something uh, to help defray expenses and promote the work of the gospel, you're free to do that. Again, this is free. There's no pressure on that. And uh, this evening, uh, it was my understanding that uh, the free will offering will be split between, to help the concert, a love offering for the concert. Unless you want to specify, write that on the envelope if you wanted to go to the ministry of Herman and Sonny. You can elaborate that on the, the envelope. Or if you wanted to go to the seminar or split both ways, just put a note of that on your envelope and we'll honor your request. And they will come share their music this time while the ushers wait on you. Thank you. This is a song that Sonny wrote following 9-11 that talks about the great price that's all the day for freedom. And uh, this song blends the theme of flying the cross. We want to thank the hundreds of thousands of young men and women who have given their lives for the freedoms of this world. But in this song, we honor Christ for the price, the ultimate price that he paid for each one of us.
you, Herman and Sonny. I want to remind you that tapes and CDs will be available at the end of the program by Herman and Sonny Park. If you enjoy their music and would like to hear that music again, that would be a wonderful way to do so and help their ministry as well. And could you do us one more favor? I had to remember this on my way in. Those electronic devices, cell phones, etc., it'll help keep uh, the distractions down if we can turn those to vibrate at least during the meeting this evening. Eric, welcome to the program. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Good evening. Welcome back. Well, tonight, what are we going to be looking at? Tonight, our subject is the United States in Bible Prophecy. We are going to find out through the pages of Scripture tonight what role the United States is going to play in end-time Bible prophecy. I want to make sure that you have a Bible with you this evening so that you can follow along. If you don't have one with you tonight, please just raise your hand. We'll make sure that one is brought to you. We want to make sure that everybody can follow along. So if you don't have one and would like one, just raise your hand. One of our ushers will bring one to you. Tomorrow evening, our subject is Unmasking the Antichrist. We are going to find out who the Antichrist is. We'll be walking through the pages of Scripture, and we will find 11 identifying characteristics that will let us know beyond any shadow of a doubt who the Antichrist is. So be sure to be here tomorrow night for that. Then Thursday evening, our subject is Revelation's Greatest Power. We are going to be looking at a power in the book of Revelation that is much more powerful than the Antichrist. And this is going to be one of the most uplifting and encouraging messages of the whole series. So be here on Thursday for that. Friday night, our subject is America Under Attack. There has been an attack going on in the United States for many, many years that has caused much more devastation, much more death, and much more anger and pain than anything that a terrorist organization could possibly conceive of. We're going to find out what that attack is, where it has been coming from, and you're going to be amazed when you find out that it's Friday night, America, under attack. Uh, don't really have too many other announcements tonight. Remember, if you do have a question on something, just write that question down, drop it in one of the question buckets out there, and we will be more than happy to take those questions as we have opportunity. We're going to go ahead and do our drawing now, so my wife is going to be making her way up here. Uh, remember, from this point on in the seminar, to take your tickets and drop them in the bucket as you come in, we're going to be doing some drawings tonight from those tickets. So not only will we sometimes do drawings from the first two rows here, but we're also going to do some from the green tickets, which you drop in the bucket as you come in. All right. Tonight we have two gifts. One gift is a poster, time running out, dealing with some of the signs of the times that we looked at last evening, or I guess two evenings ago when we came together. And the second gift that we have is a CD from Herman and Sonny Hart. So you may choose which of those two gifts you would like to take home with you this evening. Pull out your green ticket books and look at the little red number on the front of your green ticket book. And I'm going to read off one person who put their stub in here. And this will be our first winner. You can choose which of these two gifts you would like. The first winner is the person who is holding ticket number 61747. 61747. Look at the green ticket book that you have in your possession. The little red number on the front of it. Do we have a winner? Congratulations. Would you like the poster or the CD? The CD. Okay, that wasn't too difficult a choice, was it? Praise the Lord. And for our poster tonight, it will be the person holding ticket number 52532. 52532. Congratulations. Very good. We'll be giving away a few more things tomorrow evening. We've got one more thing to give away tonight, and that is our concordance. I promised that we would give the concordance away to the person who brings the most first time guests with them each evening, and tonight will be no different. Did anybody bring, and well, I'm going to start with this. How many of you brought somebody with you tonight that's their first time? We've got a hand over here, one over here, another one, about five or six people. Did anybody bring five or more guests with them tonight? Five or more guests. How about four or more guests? We have four or more. How about three? Three or more guests tonight. Two. Two or more. We've got two over here. Anybody else bring two or more guests with them this evening? Congratulations. You get to take that home with you tonight. We'll be giving another one away again tomorrow night, so make sure that you bring some friends with you. Wasn't too difficult to get the high number tonight. Only two people. So tomorrow night, hopefully we'll get a few more people. Bring some in. You may get to take home that as well. Okay, that's it for our announcements. That
that means it's time for us to get a little bit of air in our lungs. We are going to sing together, and our theme song, as usual, is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I'll invite you to stand with me as Pastor Mike leads us. debts. 
When France was in danger of collapsing in 1956, it was the Americans who propped it up. When earthquakes hit distant cities, it is the United States that hurries in to help. You talk about Japanese technocracy and you get radios. You talk about German technocracy and you get automobiles. You talk about American technocracy and you find men on the moon, not once, but several times and safely home again. You talk about scandals and the Americans put theirs right in the store window for everybody to look at. Boy, he sure got that one right, didn't he? He says, I can name you 5,000 times when the Americans have raced to the help of other people in trouble. Can you name me even one time when someone else raced to the Americans in trouble? Our neighbors have faced it alone, and I'm one Canadian who is blank tired of hearing them get kicked around. They will come out of this thing with their flag high. Stand proud America. I'm proud to be an American, aren't you? God has blessed this country abundantly. Could it be, however, that somewhere, somehow, in the Bible, since this is such a, a powerful country and a blessed country at end time, could it be that God has somehow, somewhere, identified this country in the prophecies of the Bible? That's what we want to find out tonight. We know that he has identified many countries in the Bible. In fact, 14 of them that we've looked at already in this seminar together. When we looked in Daniel chapter 2 with that metallic man, we saw an image that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. Then he gave it to Daniel. And in that image was some very significant messages. Let's review very quickly that image. The head, in the image, the head of the image in Daniel chapter 2 was made up of what metal? Gold. Chest and arms were made of what? Silver. Belly and thighs were made of? Grass. Legs were made of iron, and the feet were made of iron and clay. Okay, now this prophecy, as I mentioned early on, lays the foundation for all the other major time prophecies in the Bible. So we're going to keep coming back to this one because it is so significant. Let's review now what those different metals represented, what kingdoms. The head of gold represented the kingdom of what? Babylon. Chest and arms of silver represented the kingdom of? Medo-Persia. Then you had the belly and thighs of brass or bronze. They represented the kingdom of what? Greece. The legs of iron represented what kingdom? Rome. And the feet of iron and clay, they represented what? Divided Europe. And then there was something significant that was going to happen to that image. What would hit the image on its feet? The stone would, exactly. Now, God has identified all those different kingdoms. Could it be that he has also, somewhere in the Bible, identified the United States of America? Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. We're going to see what we can find this evening. Now, as you're turning to Revelation chapter 13, I want to share with you kind of an overview of that chapter. Revelation 13 is divided into two parts. Verses 1 through 10 describe sort of a composite leopard-like beast, and verses 11 through 17 describe a two-horned lamb-like beast. So we're going to take a look at these beasts a little bit this evening and see what we can understand about them. Let's begin in Revelation 13, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. John, of course, is writing the book of Revelation. He's on the Isle of Patmos off of the uh, coast of Turkey, and he's trying to write something that applies to us today. Let's see what he has to say. In Revelation 13, verse number 1, he says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. There on the screen we see one artist's representation of what that beast may have looked like, and here's another artist's representation of what that beast may have looked like. Now, just by show of hands, how many of you have seen this animal at the Kansas City Zoo? <laughs> and have you seen him down there? No, of course not. This is not a real animal. Could we then agree that this animal is symbolic of something? If we can agree on that, let me hear an amen. Okay, so what is this animal symbolic of? We want to try to see if we can figure that out. Now, in order to understand how to understand or how to interpret Bible prophecy, we need to lay down some principles that we're going to use. Because we can't just go making up what things represent. So pull out your notes and write down these two principles that we're going to use tonight and through the remainder of our seminar to help us understand what Bible prophecy means. So two principles to understand Bible prophecy. Here's the first one. Principle number one, the Bible must be its own interpreter. Principle number one, the Bible must be its own interpreter. Let's turn over to 2 Peter now. Keep a marker here in Revelation 13. We're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 
verses 19 through 21. Now, if you're unfamiliar with your Bible, 2 Peter's not that difficult to find. You can either look it up in the table of contents at the beginning of your Bible, or if you're in Revelation right now, start flipping backward just a little bit until you hit the book of Hebrews. Once you hit Hebrews, which is sort of like the first large book that you'll hit going backwards from Revelation, it is between, 2 Peter is between Hebrews and Revelation. It's a tiny little book. If you run into 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John, you're in the neighborhood. So look for 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. We're looking now at the first principle that we're going to use to understand or interpret Bible prophecy. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. If you found it, let me hear an amen. Okay, that sounds like the majority of us. The rest of you can continue to get there. It'll take me just a moment to read through. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse number 19. Peter says in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now, I like that. Peter says there's something about prophecy that is what? Sure. He says we have a more sure word of prophecy. He doesn't just say it's sure. He says it's more sure. Well, more sure than what? If you read the context in which he makes this statement, read the preceding verses. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration experience when he and James and John saw Jesus transfigured on the mount. And he says that prophecy is more sure than what he saw with his own eyes. Is that pretty sure? That is absolutely sure. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. He says, prophecy is like a light that shines into a dark place. Kind of like the headlights on your car. I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever driven out in the Walmart parking lot late at night and you head yourself down the road toward home and you realize all of a sudden that it's very dark? What did you forget to do? Forgot to turn on your headlights. Now, most cars today have those automatic ones, so we don't have to worry about that. But you forget to turn on your headlights. Now, if you don't turn on your headlights, what might happen to you? Might have a wreck, right? You know, if you don't turn on your spiritual headlights, in other words, understand the prophecies of the Bible, the light that shines ahead into a dark place, if we don't turn on our spiritual headlights, we can very well have a spiritual wreck. So prophecy is like the light that shines into a dark place. Now look at verse 20. Verse 20, Peter says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any, what kind of interpretation? Private. He says, it's not up to you to decide what it means. It's not up to me. It's not up to some church or some guy on television or on the radio. It's not of any private interpretation. He says that in verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the who? The holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible writers to write down what they did, and he says that it's not up to you to privately interpret that. So let's look at our second principle now. Our second principle is that we must compare Scripture with Scripture. Now our text for this is in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. The book of Isaiah you'll find near the very center of your Bible. Just take your Bible and crack it right to the center. You'll probably end up in Isaiah. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10 for our second principle, which is we must compare Scripture with Scripture. Isaiah chapter 28, Verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 28, verse number 9. Isaiah writes these words. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. In other words, he says, it's all well and good to study the milk of the word for a while. Those would be things like studying God's love for us or the angels and things like that. But eventually, you've got to get beyond the milk of the word and get into the what? meat of the word. And what is the meat of the word? The meat of the word is the doctrine, it's the prophecy. And if you're going to get into the meat of the word, studying the doctrines or the prophecies of the Bible, how do you do that safely? Look at the next verse. Verse 10, he says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. In other words, look at all the scriptures that have anything to say about a particular topic, study them all together, there may be one over here, another one over here, some in the Old Testament, some in the New Testament, bring them all together, and read them all together, and then you've got a pretty good idea of what the Bible teaches on that subject. You know, you can make the Bible say just about anything that you want by taking only one or two scriptures. For example, 
There's a scripture in the Bible that says that Judas went out and hung himself. There's another scripture elsewhere in the Bible where Jesus says, Go thou and do likewise. Now you can pull those two together and come to the conclusion that the Bible says we should all go out and hang ourselves. Is that what the Bible teaches? No, absolutely not. But that's where many people get into trouble. They just take one scripture from here and another one from there, and they want the Bible to say something. You can make the Bible say just about anything you want, but that is not good, solid Bible study. If we can agree to that, let me hear an amen. amen. So what I'm going to do through the seminar is use a principle that I'm going to call the fence post principle. And here's what it basically says. Imagine that each scripture on a subject is like a fence post. And let's say we have 50 scriptures on a particular subject. Most of them, as you read them through very carefully and just, just right across the surface, will come together and be in complete harmony with one another. Does the Bible contradict itself, yes or no? No, it does not. All scripture must be in agreement with all other scripture. And most of it, on the first reading, seems to fit in very clearly. So each one of those scriptures we're going to imagine is a fence post, and we'll plant those scriptures, those fence posts, in a line. In order for a fence to be of any use, all the fence posts have to be in a line. But occasionally, as you're studying a particular topic, and you read through the scriptures that relate to that topic, you may come across two or three of them that don't seem, on first reading, to fit together with all the rest of them. So let's say we've got 47 fence posts out of those 50 that are all very clear and say the same thing and they line up perfectly. And we've got three more scriptures on the same subject that on first reading don't appear to say the same thing. They appear to contradict. So those three fence posts are going to be out of line with the 47. If that makes sense, let me hear an amen. Okay. Now can we leave fence posts out of line as we study the Bible, yes or no? No, we can't. So we've got to bring them all into line. Now we have one of two things we can do. We can either uproot the 47 fence posts and put them in line with the three, or we can uproot the three and put them in line with the 47. Which should we uproot, the 47 or the three? The three, absolutely. Now, how do we uproot those three? We study more diligently those three scriptures which appear to be out of line with the 47 until we understand them clearly in light of the 47. Then we can move them into line with the 47 so that all 50 of them are now in line. If that makes sense, let me hear an amen. Okay, so you're going to hear me talk about the fence post principle uh, periodically as we go through this seminar. So here are our two principles to understand Bible prophecy. One, we must let the Bible be its own interpreter. And two, we must compare Scripture with Scripture. If you can agree with me that those are good, safe, solid Bible study principles to go by, let's hear an amen. Okay, very good. Let's start using them now. Back to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13. This first beast, it says, rises up out of the sea. We're in Revelation 13, verse number 1. It says that it rises up out of the sea. Well, what do seas represent in Bible prophecy? We can guess and speculate, or we can let the Bible interpret itself. What shall we do? Let the Bible interpret itself. Okay, so we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. Keep a finger or a marker right here. We want to find out what seas or waters represent. We're going to go to Revelation 17, verse 15. Revelation chapter 17 and verse number 15. What do seas or waters represent in Bible prophecy? Revelation 17, verse number 15. John, of course, is still writing here, same book, book of Revelation. In Revelation 17, verse number 15, he says, And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth. Now, in Revelation 17, verse 1, he talks about a great whore sitting upon many waters. We're going to study her in a future sermon, a future message. Verse 15 says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So according to John, what do seas or waters represent? They represent peoples, what else? Multitudes, nations, and tongues. Or in other words, populated areas of the earth where there are different peoples, different multitudes, different nations, different tongues. Seas or waters represent people, nations, and languages or populated areas where there are different nations and different languages. Now, where did we get that interpretation from? Did we get that from Eric or did we get it from the Bible? I'm not convinced. Was that from Eric or the Bible? That was the Bible. We're not putting our own interpretation. We are letting the Bible interpret itself, and we are comparing Scripture with Scripture so that we can understand what the Bible writer's intent was. So we know what seas or waters represent. Now let's go back to Revelation 13 again. Revelation chapter 13, we're going to read through.
through the first half of Revelation chapter 13, but we're going to try to pull a few things together here. Revelation chapter 13, and we're starting back in verse number 1. Revelation 13 verse 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and how much of the world? All the world wondered after the beast. That's interesting. Verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Virtually every Bible scholar that I am aware of is in agreement on this. This first beast of Revelation 13 that we are reading about right now is none other than the Antichrist. Virtually everybody that I'm aware of that I've read their work agrees on this point. This is describing the Antichrist. Tomorrow night when we come back, we are going to identify the Antichrist so you don't want to miss it. But let's keep on reading. Verse 5. Verse 5 says, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. How many years is forty-two months? Three and a half years. Keep that time period in mind. Plays a big role in Bible prophecy. Verse number six. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, and to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So unless we worship the Lamb, who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Then the Bible makes it clear at any time you're going to be worshiping Antichrist. So at any time there's only two choices. Either Jesus Christ or Antichrist. Now drop down to verses 15, pardon me, 16 through 18. Verse 16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. How much is six hundred, three score, and six? That is 666, and we are going to be studying that number in the very near future as well, and finding out what its significance is. So there we have the first beast that's described in Revelation chapter 13. Now let's take a look briefly at the second beast. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 says, And I beheld another beast, so this one's different from the first beast. I beheld another beast coming up out of the what? The earth. Now the first one came up out of the what? Sea. What is seas represent in Bible prophecy? Populated areas of the earth. So if this second beast is coming up not out of the sea, is it coming up in a populated area of the earth? Yes or no? No, it's not, because if it was, it would be coming up out of the what? Out of the sea. So this must be then be a sparsely populated area of the earth. So as the second beast comes up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth, and them which dwell therein, to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So we've got two separate and distinct beasts that are described in Revelation chapter 13. The first beast, or first beast exercises, I should say, global religious control. Take a look at verses 7 and 8. Speaking of the first beast, in verse, verses 7 and 8, Revelation 13, it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall what? Worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That is global religious control. The second beast exercises global economic control. Take a look at verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, 
to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might what? Buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So unless you receive the mark of the beast, you will not be able to buy or sell. That is global economic control. These two beasts will ultimately dominate the entire world religiously and economically. Well, what does a beast symbolize in the Bible prophecy? Now, we've got two options. We can guess or we can let the Bible interpret itself. What shall we do? We're going to let the Bible interpret itself. Certainly we are. Now, if there's something that we don't immediately understand, something's not immediately clear in the book of Revelation, what book can we often go to to help us understand Revelation? Daniel. Let's flip over to Daniel now. We're going to go to Daniel, and again, if you don't have a marker in Daniel yet, please put one there because we spent quite a bit of time there. We're going to go to Daniel, and instead of going to Daniel chapter 2 this time, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to start by looking at verses 2 and 3. Here Daniel has another vision. It's a different vision, but no less significant. Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Daniel 7, verse number 2. Chapter 7, verse 2 of the book of Daniel reads, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So he sees this great sea, he sees wind blowing over it, and four great beasts rising up out of the sea. We're trying to figure out what these beasts represent, but let's begin to put our Bible prophecy understanding or interpretation keys into the lock and see what we can find. We know that seas represent what? People. Again, our text for that was Revelation 17, verse number 15. In Bible prophecy, wind represents war or strife. You may want to write down in your notes Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 36 and 37. So as we begin to sort of put the picture together that Daniel's trying to tell us, he says, as the winds of war blow over the populated areas of the earth, great beasts arise from those areas. Well, what do beasts represent in Bible prophecy? Let's let the Bible interpret itself. We're going to go to Daniel 7, verse number 17. Daniel 7, verse 17 says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. And then in verse 23, he amplifies that statement. And in verse number 23, he says, Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth, what? Kingdom upon earth. So if we're letting the Bible interpret itself, and comparing scripture with scripture, according to Daniel, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? It represents a what? A kingdom. So what does Daniel see? He says, as the winds of war blow over populated areas of the earth, Great beasts or great kingdoms arise from those areas of the earth. So we're looking here at four great beasts or four great kingdoms or nations. So what then do we already know about that second beast of Revelation chapter 13? A beast represents a what? A kingdom or a nation. Now that really shouldn't surprise us if we use the same sort of symbolism today. How many of you have seen political cartoons before? Okay, I've got one up on the screen. We have there a ball of eagle. What nation or kingdom does that bald eagle represent? Yeah. United States of America. How about the big bear? What nation or kingdom does that represent? Yeah. Russia, certainly. So we do exactly the same thing today. That's all God is doing. He is letting, it, letting kingdoms or nations be represented by animals or beasts in the Bible. These four kingdoms which God is describing here in Daniel chapter 7 are the same four kingdoms which he described also in Daniel chapter 2. He identifies these four kingdoms four separate times in the Bible, at least in the book of Daniel. He identifies them in Daniel chapter 2, again in Daniel chapter 7, again in Daniel chapter 8, and again in Daniel chapter 11. And each time he identifies these four world-ruling kingdoms or empires, he gives additional information, more points, to help us know with certainty that we have the correct identification. So let's go down through each one of these four beasts or four kingdoms and see what kingdoms they represent. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 7, verse number 4. Daniel 7, verse number 4. Here's the first kingdom or the first beast which he identifies. Daniel 7, verse 4. He says, The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. 
This is the first beast or the first kingdom. What was the name of the first world ruling kingdom or empire? That was the kingdom of Babylon, exactly. So here God is identifying Babylon as a lion with eagle's wings. Of course, the lion is the king of beasts, the eagle is the king of birds. That beast or that animal, the lion with eagle's wings, was the, shall we call it the mascot or the symbol of the kingdom of Babylon. The ruins of Babylon have been excavated, many of them, and portions of the wall and portions of artifacts have been uncovered. What you see on the screen is a recreation of a portion of the wall that was found in Babylon. You can find these recreations of the walls in uh, Berlin, also in Turkey today. So you can see the line with the eagle's wings. Now, I don't know if you can see it or not, but you've got the wings sort of tucked in underneath the lion's belly there. It's the lion with eagle's wings. That was the representation, the symbolic representation of the kingdom of Babylon. Here you see another artifact, a golden plate of, with the lion with the eagle's wings. Babylon was also represented by the head of gold in the metallic image of Daniel chapter 2. And Babylon ruled from 605 BC down to 539 BC, only 66 years. Next we have another beast. Let's take a look at it in verse number 5. Verse 5 says, And behold, another beast, a second like to a what? A bear. And it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. This is the second beast, or the second what? Kingdom. What was the name of the second world ruling kingdom or empire? Medo-Persia. Represented Medo-Persia here. Now it has in its mouth three ribs. Evidently something has been conquered. Something has been devoured. When the Medes and the Persians came to power, they took over everything that belonged to Babylon, three provinces, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. You also notice the bear was raised up on one side. One side was evidently stronger than the other. The Persians eventually eclipsed the Medes in power and wiped them out. So you've got three provinces that were destroyed, the ribs in its mouth, and raised up on one side. One side of it was stronger than the other and eventually eclipsed it. The Medes and the Persian and the Medo-Persian Empire was also represented by the chest and arms of silver in the metallic image of Daniel chapter 2. And Medo-Persia ruled from 539 BC down to 331 BC. Let's look now at the next beast. This is verse number 6, third beast. Verse 6 says, After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. Four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So we're looking here at the third beast, or the third what? Kingdom. What was the third world ruling kingdom or empire? That was Greece, exactly. And it says here that it has four wings. Does anybody know what wings represent in Bible prophecy? Some people know. It represents speed. Write down Habakkuk 1, verses 6 through 8. Habakkuk 1, verses 6 through 8. Wings represent speed. Now, if this beast, if this animal has four wings, what kind of speed are we talking about here? This is great speed. One of the greatest assets that Alexander the Great had was the speed with which he was able to move his armies over vast distances. He moved his armies over 40,000 miles. He moved them in, in just eight years. He moved them into portions of India and so on and just conquered as he went. An incredible army and one of their greatest assets was speed. You notice also here, though, that this beast has how many heads? Four heads. Heads often represent leadership. Though Alexander the Great was able to conquer the world, he was not able to conquer himself. He ended up dying of drunk. Many people believe that he... Uh, that he died as a result of alcohol poisoning, consuming too much alcohol. A raging fever caught him, and as he lay on his deathbed, his cabinets sort of uh, came together, his leaders came together, and they asked him, when you die, who is going to rule in your place? According to historians, his answer was, the strongest. And that's exactly what happened. His kingdom was divided among his four top generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. So his kingdom was divided into four, just like that uh, beast had four heads. Now, the belly and thighs of brass also representing the kingdom of Greece in Daniel chapter 2. Greece ruled from 331 B.C. down to 168 B.C. Now we're going to take a look at the last beast, the last king, and this is sort of the ugly looking one. We're going to take a look at him in verse number 7. Daniel 7, verse 7. He writes, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, 
It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So this beast, fourth beast, represents the fourth world ruling empire or kingdom. What kingdom was that? That was Rome. Daniel 7, verse 23, he says, Thus the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. And that, of course, was the kingdom of Rome. Rome was also represented by the, the iron legs in the metallic image of Daniel chapter 2, and they ruled from 168 BC down to AD 476. Now, it's interesting that this particular beast, this fourth beast, has how many horns? Yeah. Ten horns. How many divisions of the ancient Roman Empire were there? There were ten divisions. So it's not a, not a coincidence that God pictures this beast this particular way. So Rome, as we mentioned a couple of nights ago, was not conquered by some other world ruling empire. It sort of dissolved from the inside out. It disintegrated as the Huns and the other barbarians came down and carved up that empire. So we have here four great beasts or four great kingdoms. What have we learned that's benefited us in our study of Revelation chapter 13? We're trying to figure out who this second beast is. We now know that a beast represents a what? Represents a kingdom. So we know then that we are looking for some kingdom. A beast represents a kingdom. Daniel 7 verse 23. The fourth beast represents the fourth kingdom. The second beast in Revelation chapter 13 then must also represent some kingdom. So let's begin to put together some identifying characteristics of this second beast of Revelation chapter 13. Here's our first one. Characteristic number one, a beast represents a nation. A beast represents a nation. Let's go back over to Revelation 13 now. <clears throat> and see if we can figure out what nation this beast is describing or is representing. We know it represents a nation. When does this nation rule? Let's look at Revelation 13 now, verses 16 and 17. Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Well, who is this he that's being described in Revelation 16? It's not really apparent, so let's go back one verse and see if we can uh, clarify things. Verse 15 says, and he had power. But well, we still don't know who he is, so let's go back another verse, verse 14. It says, and deceiveth them. Well, the he there is implied, but we still don't know who he is, so we're going to have to go back another verse, verse 13. And he doeth great wonders. Well, we've got another he there, but we still don't know who he is, so we're going to have to go back one more verse. Verse 12, and he exercises all the power of the first beast. So if he exercises all the power of the first beast, who is the he? Second beast, right? So when we come down to verse number 16, it says he causes all, what beast are we talking about? Second beast. So verse number 16 says, and he, the second beast, causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Those verses are describing the mark of the beast. Now, is the mark of the beast an issue that occurred way back in antiquity, or is the mark of the beast an end-time issue? How many of you would agree it's an end-time issue? Sure, it's an end-time issue. So if this beast enforces the mark of the beast, and the mark of the beast is an end-time issue, when would this nation have to rule? Would this nation rule back in antiquity, or would it rule at end time? At end time, absolutely. So we're going to put down number two. We're looking here for a nation at end time, because it enforces the mark of the beast. Well, what else can we learn and understand about it? Let's look at verses 12, 15, and 16. Verses 12, 15, and 16. Verse 12 says, And he, speaking again of the second beast, exercises all the power of the first beast before him. Verse number 15 says, And he had power. Verse 16 says, And he causeth all. That word causeth means commands. This is a very powerful beast, or a powerful kingdom. It's so powerful that it is causing people, commanding people, to receive the mark of the beast. If this nation is powerful enough to be causing most of the world to receive the mark of the beast, would this be a weak nation or a powerful nation? It would have to be a powerful nation. In fact, it would have to be the world's most powerful nation in order to do what the Bible indicates it does. So number three, we're looking for the world's most powerful nation at end time. 
and you don't have to look very far or ask many people who the most powerful nation is, are we living in end time today? Yes, we are. Last evening's lecture makes that very clear. What is the most powerful nation on earth today? The United States of America. There are very few people who would contest that. Now, I've heard some people say, well, I've heard the second beast is China. How many of you have heard the second beast is China before? A couple of you have. We're going to go and take a look briefly as we go through tonight at whether or not these identifying characteristics fit China. So follow along and see with me uh, if they do or if they don't. But what is the world's most powerful nation today? Several years ago, a, in, uh, in an article in the Atlantic Monthly, September 2004, T.J. O'Rourke wrote an article entitled, A Conversation with Colin Powell. And here's what Colin Powell had to say about the power of the United States of America in that time. He says, Colin Powell says the USA is a superpower that cannot be touched in this generation by anyone in terms of military power, economic power, the strength of our political system, and our value system. He says we cannot be touched by anybody. The United States of America is indeed the world's most powerful nation today. Now, is China a powerful nation? Yes. Is it anywhere near as powerful as the United States of America? Not even close. It may have power, but not nearly as powerful as the United States of America. In fact, many people are comparing the United States today, the power that we have, with the power that the ancient Roman Empire used to have. Many people are today calling us not the old Rome, which Rome was, but the new Rome. Here's an example. This one's from the Sydney Morning Herald, September 20th, 2002. It, said, it states, Americans should admit the truth and face up to their responsibilities as the undisputed masters of the world. The fact is no country has been as dominant culturally, economically, technologically, and militarily in the history of the world since the Roman Empire. We have a position of power and influence in the world that truly has not been seen since those days. Now, Revelation 13, 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, again, waters represent populated areas of the earth, so a lack of water would have to represent a sparsely populated area of the earth. We're going to put down another point here. Looking again, comparing this with the first beast, first one came up out of the sea, populated area. Second beast comes up out of an unpopulated or sparsely populated area of the earth. Number four, it rises from the earth, a new nation. Rises from the earth, a new nation, or comes up in some part of the world that is sparsely populated. Now let's go back and apply this to China. When you think about China, is that a sparsely populated area of the earth or a densely populated area of the earth? Very densely populated area of the earth. How about the United States? When this country began to grow, was North America a densely populated area or a sparsely populated area? Very sparsely populated area of the earth. George Albert Townsend wrote a, um, wrote a quote about the United States that was growing in power and influence. Like a silent seed, we grew into a nation. The Dublin Nation, a European journal, speaking of the United States in 1850, said, it was emerging and amid the silence of the earth, daily adding to its power and strength. Let's add another point now from Revelation 13, verse 11. Revelation 13, verse 11 says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a what? Like a lamb. Like a lamb. We're going to put down point number five. It would be lamb-like. Lamb-like. Well, what is a lamb like? Is a lamb a beast of prey, or is it a peaceful animal? It is a peaceful animal. When you take a look at those other beasts that we just looked at in Daniel chapter 7, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon, are those peaceful animals, or are those beasts of prey? Those are beasts of prey. When you look at how those four nations came to power, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, they overthrew the preceding world-ruling empires. What about the United States? When we came to power, did we overthrow another world-ruling empire in order to do so? No, we didn't. You know, we declared our independence from England, but we did not annihilate them. We did not destroy them. Now, granted, we did a great disservice to the Native Americans. I'm not making light of that at all. But were the Native Americans a world-ruling empire? No, they weren't. So we came up relatively peacefully, comparatively speaking. So we'll put down 5A, not a beast of prey, or come to power relatively peacefully. Now what else do we know about a lamb? Is a lamb a young animal or a mature animal? It's a young animal. So would this nation that we're trying to identify here be a young nation or an old nation? 
It would have to be a young nation. We'll put down a number B or a letter B, 5B, a young nation. Now let's go back to China once again. Is China a young nation or an old nation? China is one of the oldest nations on the face of the earth. So this point certainly doesn't fit China either. Let's add another point now, 5C. A lamb. What is a lamb characterized by? A lamb is characterized by freedom, innocence, gentleness, and energy. So we also have to be looking here for a nation that is characterized by freedom, innocence, gentleness, and energy. You know, this uh, lamb that you see me holding here on the screen, we got to meet him in Iowa. It was lambing season when we happened to be there, and he was four days old. And let me tell you, he was full of lots of energy. Very gentle, hopping around, but characterized by freedom, innocence, gentleness, and energy. Now, while it's true, over the last few decades, America may be a little less innocent, we may have a, little, a few more, uh, fewer freedoms, are we still a nation which is characterized by freedom, yes or no? Yes, we are. When you go to other nations of the world, you will be impressed with the freedoms that we have here today. And it's true we've lost some of them, but we are, by, by leaps and bounds, one of the most free nations on the face of the earth. The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution states, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We have freedom of religion, we have freedom of assembly, we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of the press. These are freedoms that other countries wish that they had. You go to some other countries in the world and you will realize how blessed you are to live in the United States of America. Amen? How many of you have been abroad and can testify to that? It's amazing what we do have here in the United States, even though it seems like some of it may be slipping away. So 5C, we're looking for a nation characterized by freedom, innocence, gentleness, and energy. Let's add 5D. 5D, a lamb-like nation. Who is a lamb represented by the prophecy? Represents Christ. Now, it's interesting as you study Bible prophecy, I want to dwell on this for just a moment. It's very easy to get caught up in all of the beasts in Bible prophecy and figuring out what they all represent and what's going to be happening at end time. The lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon, the first beast of Revelation 13, the second beast of Revelation 13. Who is the Antichrist? Who's the second? How does this all fit together? Don't miss this. Don't miss the lamb among the beasts. As you are studying Bible prophecy, focus on the lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus Christ. Because it is possible to know all that there is to know about the prophecies of the Bible. But if you don't know the Lamb, if you don't know Jesus Christ, does it do you any good? Not one bit of good. You focus first on the Lamb. Get to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior first. And He can help you understand all the rest of the symbols in Bible prophecy. Amen? So don't get the cart before the horse. Make sure you know the Lamb first, and He will help you understand all the rest of the beast. So let's put down 5D. 5D, we are looking here for a Christian nation, or at least from the most, most of the eyes of the rest of the world, a Christian nation. Now let's go back and talk about China for a moment. Has China been recognized since antiquity as a Christian nation? No. First of all, it was a pagan nation, and now it's become a, a communist nation. Point. While it is true that Christianity is growing in popularity over there, it is certainly not a Christian nation. So 5D, looking for a Christian nation. Let's review very quickly what we found so far. Number one, we recognize that a beast represents a nation. So we know we're looking for some nation or some kingdom. Number two, it is a nation that rules at end time because it enforces the mark of the beast. Number three, it is the world's most powerful nation at end time for the same reason. Number four, it rises from the earth. In other words, it would have to be a new nation, not arising in some populated area of the earth. Number five, it would be lamb-like, not a beast of prey, living relatively peacefully as it comes to power. 5B, a young nation, not an old one. 5C, a nation characterized by freedom, innocence, gentleness, and energy. And 5D, a Christian nation. Those five points that we have up on the screen, where did we get them from? Did we get them from Eric or the Bible? Bible. Very good. Okay, let's add another one now. Number six, we are looking here for a democracy or a republic. Now, how do we know that we're looking for a democracy or a republic? When you look at the first beast in Revelation chapter 13, it talks about this beast having seven, pardon me, having ten horns, and upon its horns it has ten what? Ten crowns. What sort of a government does a crown generally depict? 
a monarchy or a kingdom, something where a king or a queen rules. How about the second beast? The second beast has two horns, but on its horns, does it have any crowns? No, it doesn't. So it would have to be some other kind of a nation. Well, what kind of a nation would it be? Would it be a, a democracy? Would it be a dictatorship? How would we know what kind of a nation other than a monarchy? Take a look at verse 14. Revelation 13, verse 14. Revelation 13, verse 14 says, speaking of the second beast, and he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound, had the wound by a sword and did live. So you see here, the people are the ones making the image to the beast. The power of the government is in the hands of the people. We are looking here at a democracy or a republic. The power of the government is in the hands of the people. Let's add now another point. Revelation 13, verse number 12. Revelation 13, verse number 12 says, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So the second beast causes the, first, causes the world to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. If this second beast that we're looking at tonight is indeed the United States of America, what would that mean? In order for the United States to lead the world to worship the first beast and receive his mark, the United States must first lead the world politically, economically, and militarily. Let's put down point number seven. Point number seven, eventually leads or controls the world politically, economically, and militarily. So first, politically and economically. Secondly, not only in the militarily, but also in worship and religion, because it forces the whole world to what the first beast? To worship. So number seven, it would first lead the world politically and economically, and second, in worship and religion. Do we as a country lead the world politically and economically today? Yes, we are. So it looks like this second beast may well be the United States of America. But if that's the case, then what does that mean? Here's Time Magazine. This is May 9, 1994. The article states, America is the planet's sole remaining superpower. That was in 1994. 1992. This is the New Republic, July 29, 1992. There is no prospect in the immediate future of any power to rival the United States. We now have a highly unusual world structure with a single power, the United States, at the apex of the international system. So he says, we have a strange situation where the United States is the leading power in the world. From the Washington Post, August 21, 1991. America's power will now determine all major global events. You stop and think about it, whenever there's some sort of a peace accord that needs to be brokered somewhere in the world, who is it that goes in and brokers it? The United States. When troops need to be sent to some country in the world to bring peace, who is it that sends in troops? The United States. We have our foot in virtually every country in the world in some way, shape, or form. I'm not making any political statements here. I'm just saying look what the Bible says and look what's happening in our world today. We are seeing fulfillments of prophecy in our time. As the, lead, as the last military and economic superpower, America's policies and leadership are begrudgingly seen as setting the world agenda. This is ABC News, November 8, 2000. It looks like this might well be the United States of America that is being described. Is God describing this great country in which you and I live today in the Bible? Revelation 13, verse 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. A lamb represents who in the Bible? Represents Jesus in the Bible. Who does the dragon primarily represent? Represents the devil. What we're seeing here is a change in character. A lamb-like beast, a professedly Christian nation, which is experiencing a change in character. Now, for some of you who are perhaps a little bit older than me, and some of you who are even about as old as me, has America, over the last 20 or 30 years, begun to change a little bit in character? Are we the same leave it to beaver country we used to be? No, we're not. There is a change going on in the United States. Are we becoming more Christian as a society or less Christian? 
How many of you would agree we're becoming a little less Christian as a society? That's not a good thing. But it was prophesied. We would have a lamb-like beast that would have a change in character, begin to speak as a dragon. So number eight, it speaks as a dragon. Point number eight, speaks as a dragon. Now, it's interesting, if you stop and think about it, how does a nation speak? It says it will speak as a dragon. The only official speaking that a nation does is by passing laws. When a nation passes laws, it tells the rest of the world what it holds dear, what standards it upholds. And this lamb-like beast begins to speak as a dragon. Well, what would that necessarily then mean? This nation then would someday pass laws, number one, restricting religious freedoms, and number two, enforcing religious observances. Now, how do we know that? Look at Revelation 13, verse 12. Revelation 13, verse 12 says, And he, second beast, exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth, and again that word means commands, the earth and them which dwell therein to what? Worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. That is legislated worship. Number nine, it makes an image of the first beast. This is from Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. Verse 15 says, <clears throat> And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. So number nine makes an image of the first beast, and we're going to elaborate on that in an upcoming evening. Let's add now our tenth point. Point number ten, it forces the world to receive the mark of the beast. This is verse number 16. Verse 16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Number 10, forces the world to receive the mark of the beast. There are 10 points that you see on the screen describing this second beast of Revelation chapter 13. Did those 10 points come from Eric or from the Bible? From the Bible. Now, if this is a timeline of events, where are we today in this timeline? If this is the United States which is being described, we would probably be somewhere between point seven and point eight. Point seven is would eventually lead or control the world, and there are very few people who would uh, contest that we as a country lead and control the world today. In fact, uh, point number eight says it would speak as a dragon. We might be able to draw that line down just a little bit lower with some of the laws that would be passed in this great country of ours today that are certainly less Christian than they are uh, Christian. Amen? So the last two, number nine and number ten, making the image of the beast and forcing the world to worship or partly to receive the mark of the beast, those two are yet future. So it could well be that God is identifying the United States of America as the second beast of Revelation 13. Now here's an interesting quote I'll share with you in a moment who said it. Democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate who promises the most benefits from the public treasury. As a result, a democracy always collapses over loose financial policy and is always followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest powers has been 200 years. That statement made by Alexander Tyler. If you stop and think about it, as a nation, how old is the United States of America? A little over 200 years. Very, very interesting. Could this be the United States of America that God is identifying here in Revelation chapter 13? And if it is, that leaves us with another big question. And that big question is, who is the first beast of Revelation chapter 13? The Antichrist. Who is this that God warns us so strongly about? Let's turn over to Revelation 14, verses 6 through 10. We're going to look at this warning which God gives us about the Antichrist beast. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 10. Revelation 14, verse number 6. John writes, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This is a message that is intended to go to the whole world. Verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And what? Worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. We are called to worship the Creator, the one who made the heaven, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. Verse 8. 
And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Here's one of the six times that Babylon is mentioned in Revelation. It says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now look at verse 9. Here's the, here's the warning that God gives us about the Antichrist beast. Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man, what? Worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. When he talks about fire and brimstone there, what's he talking about? What's fire and brimstone? That's hell. He's talking about hell right there. He says, those who choose to worship the beast and receive his mark, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So the first angel calls us to worship the Creator. The third angel warns us, don't worship the beast. What is the big issue at end time? It's worship. It's about who you're going to worship. Each person is either going to worship the Creator or they are going to worship the beast. The world will be divided into two groups. One group worships the Creator, the other group worships the beast, worships the Antichrist. The question is, who will you worship? Will you worship the beast or will you worship the Creator? I don't know about you, but for myself, I want all my love, all my loyalty, all my worship and all my praise to go to my Creator. I choose God. How about you? you know, each one of us has to make that choice. Who are we going to choose? And who are we going to encourage others to choose? How many of you would like to join with me tonight and say, Lord, I choose you. I choose you. When it comes down to it and the issue of worship, I will worship Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's what Christianity is all about. Choosing Him and no other. Well, that leaves us with a couple of other questions yet to answer. First one is, who is this Antichrist beast? Second, what is his mark? And third, what about 666? Well, according to my clock that I've got up here, it's 8.30. And I promise to get you out on time. So that means we're going to have to come back again. And we're going to find the answers to some of those questions tomorrow night. Our subject will be unmasking the Antichrist. You don't want to miss it. Let's stand this evening as we close with prayer. <laughs> Please bow your head with me. Father in heaven, again we come before you with thankfulness for preserving your word down through the centuries and giving us the ability to open its sacred pages today and study it. Lord, we realize that sometimes as we study, we may come across some things that we've never seen before and may make us feel a little bit uncomfortable but we trust that you have placed them within your holy word for a reason. And we ask that you would give us the wisdom and the knowledge to search through the scriptures, to compare scripture with scripture, to let the Bible be its own interpreter, so that we may understand the message that you have placed there many, many years before. We understand that that message speaks to us today, and the big message that you're trying to get through to us is that worship is the big issue at end time. So Lord, we ask that you would touch our hearts and help us to turn our lives wholly and completely over to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, because it is He alone who can save us. And it is in His name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow night.